In this lesson, we're going to be looking closely at unemployment. We're going to define unemployment, look at the different types of unemployment a country's economy might experience, talk about the formula for calculating the unemployment rate, identify some of the causes, do a graphical, do a graphical analysis using an ADAS model, and finally we'll outline some of the solutions to the different types of unemployment that might exist. We'll start with the definition of unemployment. Now, if you're studying macroeconomics, you've probably learned that keeping the nation's unemployment rate low is one of the major macroeconomic objectives of government policymakers. But what exactly is unemployment? Unemployment refers to the condition of a worker being out of work, looking for a job, but unable to find a job. So that's a very specific definition. Not having a job is different than being unemployed. Many people who do not have jobs in a country are not unemployed. For example, young people who aren't of working age, old people who are retired and no longer part of the labor force, or students who are in school or university, getting an education and not actively looking for a job. So to be considered unemployed, somebody must be actively looking for a job but unable to find one. That's the definition of unemployment. Now, to get more detailed, we have to break down the different types of unemployment that a country's economy might experience. Let's start with one called frictional unemployment. Frictional unemployment is a very common type of unemployment that refers to a situation in which a worker is in between jobs, or a student has graduated or finished school and is looking for his or her first job. Frictional unemployment is a very natural type of unemployment. Every economy will be experiencing some degree of frictional unemployment at all times. It's also a sign that an economy is perhaps even healthy. Having frictional unemployment indicates that workers are confident enough to leave a job and look for a new job. It also indicates that students are graduating from universities or schools and looking for their first jobs. So frictional unemployment is going to be included in what we call the natural rate of unemployment, which we will talk about a little bit later. A second type of unemployment that exists in every nation's economy is structural unemployment. This is unemployment arising from changes in the structure of a nation's output. Now clearly we need some more information to get a good idea of what this is really referring to. For example, as the output shifts from primary commodities to secondary or on to tertiary, which refers to services, the need for different types of labor changes. Structural unemployment is also what we consider a natural or normal type of unemployment. Every country should be experiencing structural unemployment at all times, and it's not necessarily a sign of a sick or weak economy. Structural unemployment could be a sign that technological change and globalization are actually driving economic growth in a country. The third type of unemployment is called cyclical. This is the least desirable and the most harmful type of unemployment that a country could experience. We refer to cyclical unemployment as demand deficient unemployment. In other words, this is the unemployment that arises from a fall in aggregate demand. In other words, when an economy is in a recession, cyclical unemployment exists. Clearly, the words recession and demand deficient imply that an economy is not doing well. We'll graph the different types of unemployment using an ADS model in just a moment. But first, let's talk about the formula. Usually, when discussing unemployment, we refer to the unemployment rate. The unemployment rate refers to the proportion of the total labor force that is unemployed at any given time. So we're going to write out a simple equation here. The unemployment rate is measured by measuring the number of unemployed people in an economy using the definition above, workers who are out of work, looking for a job and unable to find a job, divided by the number of people in what we call the total labor force, or the TLF. The total labor force. This includes everybody in a nation above the age of 16 who is either employed or unemployed. In other words, people who are looking for a job, unable to find one, or already have a job. The total labor force does not include people who are not looking for jobs. In other words, university students, 
older high school students, individuals who are not actively looking for jobs or not actually employed or not part of the labor force. So once we divide the number of unemployed by the number in the total labor force, we multiply this by 100, and that gives us the unemployment rate, or the percentage of the total labor force that is, at any given time, unemployed. Before we do our graphical analysis, let's talk about some of the f causes of frictional, structural, and cyclical unemployment. Now, as I already explained above, frictional unemployment exists when people are in between jobs or when people are leaving school and looking for their first jobs. So why might the level of frictional unemployment be higher in some countries than in others? Well, this really has to do with labor market rigidities. What do we mean by this? How hard is it for people who are looking for new jobs to find new jobs? In other words, if there is easy access to information about employment, then the frictional unemployment should be lower. If people are able to move around a country and move to different places where jobs exist, then frictional unemployment will be lower. However, if there are rigidities in the labor market or obstacles to people finding information about where jobs exist or the ability to move to different places in the country in order to take those jobs, then we would expect frictional unemployment to be a little bit higher. So what are the causes of structural unemployment? Technological change that makes certain types of labor redundant. For example, robots come into a factory and replace factory workers. Technological change can cause structural unemployment. And globalization is the second major cause of structural unemployment. As more and more goods are produced in low-wage countries, such as China, around Southeast Asia, or Latin America, workers in the industries that are no longer producing those goods in the rich world will become structurally unemployed. Now, you may say that that's a terrible thing, that structural unemployment is a bad thing because those workers have little hope of finding new jobs. And on a personal, individual level, there's no doubt that structural unemployment is undesirable. But overall, do technological change and globalization indicate improvements or deterioration in a country's economic situation? I think it's pretty clear that both of the causes of structural unemployment are generally good for a nation's economy as a whole. So we can conclude that structural unemployment, while difficult for those who are experiencing it, is not necessarily a sign of a sick or unhealthy economy. Referring to cyclical unemployment, we already indicated that cyclical unemployment arises from a fall in aggregate demand. Hence the other name for this type of unemployment, demand deficient unemployment. This could also be caused by a recession. So the third type of unemployment, cyclical, is clearly the least desirable. It is a sign of a nation's economy being very sick, and there is a level of demand for the nation's goods that is below the full employment level. Individuals who would normally be employed in a nation's economy, if it were producing not full employment, are unable to find jobs when there is cyclical unemployment. Hence, it is the least desirable type of unemployment in a nation. Here we go.